welcome to Unit 2 of Allied Health Career Training Certified Nurse Aid course. Today we're going to talk about residents of the adult care home. A resident is someone that lives in an adult care home, and an adult care home is the type of facility that they live at, such as a long-term care facility or nursing home, an assisted living, or a residential health care facility. So keep in mind the residents are who we are going to be taking care of. In this particular unit, we are going to be talking about aging processes and also social attitudes regarding aging persons. So we're going to think about the different things we picture when we hear the word elderly or think about old people. Um, identifying these things that we think about will help us provide resident care with a greater understanding and respect. So right now, I just want to take a minute and I want you to close your eyes and picture an elderly person. What do you see when you think about an older person? So what are you thinking about? Let's talk about some different stereotypes. So some different stereotypes about aging is that old age starts at 65. Not true. Some of us younger people, how many of you feel like you're already an old person by the time you get up in the morning? I know I do sometimes and it's difficult, you know, to want to get out of bed and um, sometimes your joints ache and sometimes you feel like, man, I am just feeling like an old person today. So most elderly people live in an adult care home. This is also another stereotype and we will get to that in our next slide and talk about that. A lot of older adults seem to be isolated and alone. This is also not true sometimes. A lot of elderly people have lots and lots of friends and they still get out and they're active um, in the community and church groups and you know senior centers and different things like that. Um, a lot of older people will sell their homes and travel. So that's awesome. I wanna do that someday. <laughs> so how about older people being useless segments of society? I really don't like this stereotype because I feel that there is a lot that we can gain from older people in general uh, because of their knowledge and experience with different things and we really shouldn't write off those older people as being useless at all. How about all elderly people have trouble remembering and become confused? How many of you that are not elderly have trouble remembering things and sometimes become confused of details. This does not mean that we're old people. It means that we're human. So kind of keep that in mind. How about the elderly or poor? Have you been to some of these nursing homes that we have here in Wichita? Some of those places are very, very swanky. People have nice cars that they have there. It's because they have saved up money and maybe started out poor. Um, if you think about people that lived through the Great Depression, they didn't have anything. So they've learned to spend their money wisely. And a lot of people will have, um, you know, a lot of money when they get older. Not everybody does. So just kind of keep in mind, like regular adults, the elderly um, will range from being very, very poor to being very, very rich. So kind of knock that stereotype out of your mind as well. How about the elderly people are miserable most of the time? Like this poor lady in the picture. She looks kind of lost, confused, um, didn't look very happy. That is also not a good stereotype to have. Um, I know that we will run into elderly people that are miserable, but it's our job to help them figure out what it is we can, you know, help to make them not miserable. So, just kind of keep that in mind that not everybody is miserable most of the time and that you might have elderly people that have a very full life and they're very happy with the way that they are. So some different facts about aging. Now that we've identified the stereotypes, we're going to talk about the facts. So keep in mind that chronological age is not a basis for determining abilities. I've seen 30 year old people that can't even walk down the block and 85 year old people that like to get out and rollerblade. 
So just kind of keep that in mind that age is not a basis for determining abilities. Systems and organs declining at different rates. Think about somebody that maybe is an alcoholic. They are in their 40s. They have used and abused their liver. They might have an 80-year-old person's liver. And an 80-year-old person that's taking care of themselves might have a 40-year-old liver. So just kind of keep in mind that different um, organs and systems decline at different rates depending on your lifestyle, genetics, um, environmental factors, all sorts of different things will affect how your body actually ages. Some elderly people will get disease and some do not. One big thing that we will talk about in this class is dementia. Dementia is prevalent anywhere you go. Doesn't matter if you're working in a nursing home, assisted living, if you're doing home health, if you volunteer at an independent living, or you just see people out in the community. Um, dementia is there. However, not every old person gets dementia. I know a lot of people think that whenever you get old, you get senile and they've got dementia and they start forgetting a lot more. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, how many of us have forgotten where we parked our car, where our keys are, um, forgotten where our glasses are when they're on top of our heads? That is part of being human. So some elderly people will get dementia, not everybody will. And down there in the darker gray spot on this slide with memory and aging, most older adults will not face memory loss. So a lot of older adults will not have any memory problems right up until the time that they are um, declining and getting ready to die. So 12% of the population is over 65 as of 2003. That's not a huge population. You sure here in Wichita you see a lot of elderly people, but throughout the United States, only 12% of that population is over 65. Let's look at the next number. Four and a half percent of those over 65 live in long-term care. That is a very, very small number of our population that actually lives in long-term care. There are more and more people that are having to turn to long-term care or other alternatives to long-term care because of those disabilities, such as 54% of those over 65 report having at least one disability. So different disease processes such as heart failure, um, lung issues, um, having arthritis, different things like that are happening to these people, but only four and a half percent of them live in a long-term care facility. Now, a lot of people don't live in a long-term care facility because they run from nursing homes. Why are they running from nursing homes? Because the nursing homes, like we talked about in the first unit, are very much staff-based and task-oriented. That's what we're trying to change. So a lot of people see, think, hear the words nursing home and they're like, no, I don't want to ever go to a nursing home. And they run from it and run from it and run from it. And then they end up you know, getting themselves even more disabled where they eventually have to go into a nursing home and they don't have very much life left. So we're trying to make that life as positive as possible, whatever they, whatever they have left, whether it's, you know, five days or 15 years. So some financial things. Finances vary with retirement. Some people only rely on social security, um, which is not a whole lot. And some people had jobs that they worked at for 40 years and get a great retirement. So really depends on what kind of job that you had when you were working and what kind of you know retirement you saved for and what kind of retirement that your company paid for. Um, your income will decrease with retirement because you're not working anymore. So you might be on a, what's called a fixed income, and I'm sure you probably heard about that too. So you're going to have a very set amount of money every month that you can spend and different expenses coming up, such as new medications. Um, if you're having to you know, be hospitalized, you have hospital bills coming, then those things can really, really affect an elderly person. And I'm sure you've probably heard of the elderly people um, that have animals. Some of them will choose to feed their cat 
rather than feed themselves. That's going to put them at further risk for running into problems and either ending up hospitalized or ending up in a long-term care facility. One of the things we talk about with residents and how they feel is called a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This pyramid goes through basic human needs according to Abraham Maslow, who was considered the father of humanistic psychology and created this hierarchy. Now, each person needs to meet the needs at one level of the pyramid before they can move up. The ultimate goal is called self-actualization. So with this pyramid, we start with the absolute basics. Biological and physiological needs such as air, food, water, sleep, toileting needs, different things like that. Once you have those needs met, then you can move up to safety and security. So this is feeling secure in with yourself and with your environment and with the people that are taking care of you. One of the ways that you can get to the point of getting from the biological and physiological area of the pyramid up to safety and security is be consistent. Take care of the resident's needs. So if I'm your resident and I'm laying in bed and I put my call light on and I need to go to the bathroom, I can't get up out of bed by myself because it's not safe. So you don't come answer my call light and I wait and I wait. Eventually you do come answer my call light and say, I'm sorry, I'm tied up with something else. I'll be back in a few minutes to take you to the bathroom. Okay, I might understand that. So I wait and I wait and I really need to go. So I hit the call light again and I wait and I wait. And then eventually somebody else comes in and says, oh, well, they're still tied up, but they'll come back in a few minutes to take you to the bathroom. Okay, so I wait and I wait and I can't wait any longer at this point. So I either will wet the bed or I might try to get out of bed by myself. Then when you do finally do come back to see me, I don't trust you anymore because you didn't keep your word. And you caused me a lot of embarrassment of having to go to the bathroom on myself or, you know, cause me to be unsafe and get out of bed when I know I'm not supposed to. So by meeting those basic needs, then you will move into the trust area. So how do we move out of the trust and safety and security area into belongingness and love? Treat your residents with respect. Be nice to them. You know, don't go into a room and say, I can't believe you have to go to the bathroom again. Don't do that. We know that that's kind of a common sense thing. However, um, you might see people that aren't quite so nice to your residents and it's up to you to set that example and be the nice person and be respectful of your residents and make them feel like they belong. So part of this also is going to be not just what you can do for the residents, but what the residents can do for each other. So feelings of friendship, um, having family. So they might have different friends in the facility or having their family come in or even feeling, you know, could be if they don't have any family or don't have very many friends in the facility, you could be that person that makes them feel like they belong. So then if you make them feel like they belong, they will move up into the self-esteem and respect. So they feel good about themselves. They feel like they are a worthy person. They feel like, um, you know, they are still supposed to be here and they will be confident in themselves and they will, you know, keep striving for different achievements and feel like you respect them. So at the very top of the pyramid is called self-actualization. So self-actualization, a lot of people will not ever get to in their lives, but self-actualization is kind of almost doing a life review where you look back on your life and you can talk about your different accomplishments and achievements and you feel like you have had a good life and you know, you've done the things that you've wanted to do. Now self-actualization doesn't have to be reached necessarily at the end of life. It can be reached much earlier in life. So just kind of keep that in mind that, um, you know, if you're feeling good about your accomplishments and you're able to talk about them, um, and we're not talking bragging and being conceited, but, you know, feeling good about the things that you've done in your life, then you've reached that self-actualization part. Now the tricky part about the pyramid is 
you can fall off the pyramid and have to start over. So I always think of the little yodeler guy on The Price is Right. And he climbs up the side of the mountain and keeps climbing, keeps climbing, keeps climbing. Well, then something happens and he falls off and you have to start over. That's kind of what will happen to your elderly people. So think about somebody maybe that lives at home. They are driving their car. They do everything for themselves. They can travel. They've got friends. You know, they feel pretty good about their lives. Then they have a stroke and they end up having to come into a facility. They're starting back at square one. So they're having to rely on you to give them their biological and physiological needs and help them out with those. And it will take time to build back up that pyramid. So kind of keep that in mind that somebody, you know, just because somebody had a very full active life and everything before they came into your facility or, you know, they seem like they're doing okay on the outside when you see them, they are still struggling with a lot of things and they're dealing with a lot of losses whenever they have to come in and deal with um, having to rely on somebody else to take care of them. So some basic needs, we're going to kind of go into a little bit more about the basic needs. So things like oxygen. Elevating the head of the bed will help somebody breathe a little bit easier. Because think about how well you breathe when you're flat on your back if you're having difficulty. Um, if you raise that head of the bed, that will help a little bit. Rest after activities of daily living. So any activities of daily living, these are going to be all those basics that we've talked about. And getting up out of bed going to the bathroom, going out to meals, um, getting dressed for the day, all those different things. Make sure that your people have plenty of rest if they are having difficulty keeping up with the activities of daily living. Um, you can help assist with supplemental oxygen when ordered and per your facility policy and procedure. We will talk about oxygen later on in this course a little bit more in depth, but one thing I do want to point out now is you are not allowed to change the oxygen settings. Only a nurse can do that. So just kind of keep that in mind. So food. Let's talk about maintaining residence independence. Anything that we are doing, whether it's food or not, we want to have the residents have as much independence as possible. So with food, think about if they are not physically able to cut up their meat and feed themselves. What can you do to help them be independent? One of the things that you can do to help them be independent, ask them what they want to eat. So kind of think about your own personal choices with food. Um, I personally don't like meatloaf. If you try to bring me meatloaf for lunch or dinner, I'm not going to eat it. So if you ask me what I want something different, yes, I do want something different. So ask your residents what they want to eat. Even people with dementia, with that um, cognitive impairment, they still can most of the time tell you whether they like to eat something or not. So absolutely ask them what they want to eat. You might have to set up their tray with cutting their food or telling them where their food is. So when you set their plate in front of them, you might tell them, okay, here's your mashed potatoes, here's your meatloaf, here's your green beans, over here is your coffee, and here's your water, and just kind of tell them where things are. This will really, really help if you've got somebody with low vision or vision problems. You can also cue the resident to eat. Somebody that has dementia or some other cognitive impairment might get really distracted when they eat. So you might have to remind them, okay, it's time to take a bite. And just be very patient with people when you have to cue them because they may not realize that it's still time to eat. Some people with later stages of dementia may not remember that it's time to swallow. So if you see somebody that's got food in their mouth and say they have mashed potatoes for lunch and they have the mashed potatoes in their mouth and they're chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and, chewing, and they really don't know what to do with it then you can remind them, okay, go ahead and take a swallow or offer to give them a drink and then they might kind of remember, okay, I need to swallow this food so I can take a drink. So assist the resident as needed. Of course, we're gonna promote as much independence as possible for our residents, but 
Some people physically may not be able to feed themselves or they might need a steady hand. So some people with either Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, which we will talk about also more in depth, they might be shaky when they try to eat. So it's hard for them to hold all the food on their fork or their spoon, but they can technically feed themselves. You just might need to help steady their hand a little bit. And always, always, always respect the resident's choice. Now, this can get kind of tricky because we might have some of our people like our diabetics. Some of our diabetics may not understand that eating that fourth piece of cake for lunch or, you know, having a huge sandwich with a bunch of bread is probably not going to be the best thing for them. So we can encourage our residents to eat healthier, and but if they want to, you know, have that fourth piece of cake, that's their choice. I would go to the charge nurse if you have somebody that is really going outside what they should be eating and you've tried to encourage them and kind of talk to them about it. But again, it is ultimately their choice. Um, the charge nurse might be able to talk to them a little bit more and help them, you know, figure out what it is that they need to be eating. But um, if they want to eat that fourth piece of cake, that's their right. So water. Offering water to residents is extremely important. As you get older, your thirst sensation decreases a lot. So a lot of our residents are not gonna know that they need to drink water and they are not gonna get thirsty until they're already pretty well into dehydration. So you might have to cue the resident to drink. You might have to you know, physically put the straw in their mouth and help them um, to take a drink and remind them to suck on the straw and you know, take a sip in and swallow. Definitely keep your residents pitcher filled um, and within reach. Make sure that you give them fresh water because how many people um, take a glass of water, you know, they get a glass of water and drink some of it and then they leave it for several hours and you go back to the glass of water and now it's stale and you don't want to drink it. That's how your residents are going to feel. So just kind of keep that in mind that they're going to need fresh water. Know what your residents' water preferences are. A lot of older people don't like ice. So some of them love ice, some of them do not. Some might want just room temperature water. That's going to be something that's important to find out about your residents to make sure that you are meeting their needs. Um, so ask them, you know, do you like a lot of ice? Do you not like a lot of ice? Hopefully the other people that you work with as you get started in a job are going to know the residents' preferences and pay attention. You know, if you get somebody a huge pitcher of water with a ton of ice, it's completely cold and they're not drinking it, ask them, are you not drinking it because it's got too much ice in it? Um, does it not taste good to you? What's going on? How can I help where we can get you some water that'll be good for you to drink? Some other ways that you can provide for basic needs for your resident include elimination, activity, rest and sleep, and providing for sex and sexuality. <clears throat> so elimination is the process of going to the bathroom. Um, you can assist your residents to the toilet, um, use a bedpan or a bedside commode as needed, and however is dictated on the plan of care. Now the plan of care we will get into a lot more in depth um, later on in the class, but basically the plan of care is going to tell you what you need to do for your residents and how you're going to carry that out. So you can also observe for some nonverbal signs of needing to go to the bathroom, such as pacing. If someone has a distressed look on their face and they're kind of looking around, you know, seem like they kind of are looking for a bathroom. If they are pulling on the front of their clothes, that can be a sign that they need to go to the bathroom. Some other things that you can do um, as far as activity, rest, and sleep. Assist residents with ambulation, and ambulation is walking as needed and ordered on the resident plan of care. So if somebody has an order or is on the plan of care to what's called walk to dine, that's where you can take them from the room and actually walk them down to the dining room rather than using a wheelchair, which may be more convenient for the staff, but it's really not gonna do your resident any good because we want to promote as much independence as possible and keep them at the highest level of functioning as possible. Another thing you can do for activity, rest, and sleep, provide a quiet environment. No matter what shift you work, and especially night shift, 
please do not be running up and down the halls, making a lot of noise, yelling to your coworkers down the hall, um, you know, or talking really, really loud outside the residence rooms. Some of them are actually trying to sleep. And always, always, always assume that your residents can hear everything that you say. Not everyone is deaf. For sex and sexuality, you can provide privacy. So, you know, keeping the door shut if the resident wants it shut and if it's safe for that person. If you do walk into a sexual situation, do not respond critically. If you do walk into a situation where residents are confused and they're in a sexual situation, then um, refer to your charge nurse on how you can deal with that. But if someone is in their own room and say they are masturbating, don't respond critically to them and provide them privacy. They have the right to be able to do that as long as it's not infringing in upon another resident and their rights. Um, you can recognize maleness and femaleness of the resident through clothing choices and grooming. Ask the resident how they want to dress. You know, if they want, you know, if a woman wants to wear a pink shirt that day, that's great. If a man, you know, doesn't want to wear a pink shirt that day, that's great too. So whatever they want to do um, to identify as male or female, however it is for them. Ways to keep a resident safe and secure in your facility include assisting the resident to feel safe from abuse, neglect, and exploitation, handling them gently during care and helping them feel at home, providing hospitality to the resident's family and friends, and to promote trust by keeping promises, explaining your care, and using teamwork. Abuse is defined by the state of Kansas as any act or failure to act performed intentionally or recklessly that causes or is likely to cause harm to a resident. So this can include um, different physical abuse such as hitting, slapping, kicking, can include sexual abuse, um, it can include mental abuse such as yelling at or scolding a resident, it can include um, use of physical or chemical restraints. So if you have a resident that is you know not being very pleasant and they are trying to you know get out of the building if they want to leave and you tie them to the bed that would be considered a physical restraint that is um, illegal or using medications to sedate a resident is also considered a restraint a chemical kind of restraint and it is also illegal you can also you know, perform abuse by threatening or having menacing conduct towards a resident. If you steal things from them, that is called financial abuse. Um, also, if you are omitting or depriving a person of goods or services which are necessary to avoid physical or mental harm or illness. So kind of neglecting them can be a form of abuse as well. So neglect, um, as defined by the state, means the failure or omission by oneself, the caretaker or another person with a duty to provide goods or services which are reasonably necessary to ensure safety and well-being and to avoid physical or mental harm or illness. So one example of neglect could be you have a resident that is bed bound and they are not able to get up and take care of themselves and they go to the bathroom on themselves, which is called being incontinent. And you fail to go take care of the resident and to change them and clean them up and, you know, take care of that incontinence issue. That is considered neglect. So we do not want to have anybody neglect their residents, you know, it's against the law and it's also the right thing to do to take care of them. So exploitation is any misappropriation of resident property or intentionally taking unfair advantage of an adult's physical or financial resources for another individual's personal or financial advantage. So what this means is it can be something as simple as your resident, you know, has some money and maybe you don't. You talk to them about the fact that, you know, you might be a single parent trying to take care of your kids. It's coming up on school time. You need some money to help them, you know, buy school supplies. So your resident offers to help you and they say, well, you know, I'm sorry, I feel really bad for you and your kids and let me help you. And they offer to give you $50 and you take it. That is considered exploitation. 
yes, it sounds like it is a gift. However, the resident, you know, may feel obligated to you to give you that money because you take care of them. So if a resident ever offers you money or any kind of goods that are of any kind of monetary value, you have to say no. And if they continue insisting that you take the money or whatever it is that they're trying to offer you, stop and call the charge nurse and let them know. So ways to help your resident feel like they belong and feel that they are loved, absolutely show kindness to your resident, but don't forget about the visitors and staff because those visitors may be very, very important to that resident, and the resident may not feel like you care for them if you do not show kindness and respect to their visitors. Also, your residents are gonna be watching the way that you interact with other staff. So if you are taking care of a resident and you're talking to another staff member and you're bad-mouthing somebody, either another staff member, another resident, bad-mouthing a visitor, and that resident can overhear what you're talking about, they're not gonna feel like you're a very nice person and they may not feel like you care for them. So you do wanna involve your residents in conversation. Talk to them, ask them how their day is going. You know, you don't have to make it directly about whatever it is that you're helping them do. So if you're helping them get ready for the day, getting them up, getting them dressed, you know, helping them in the bathroom, brushing their hair, helping them brush their teeth, whatever it is, talk to them about different things. Ask them about, you know, how their grandchildren are doing and, oh, did you see the baseball game on TV last night? It was great, wasn't it? You know, just kind of kind of simple small talk things that you can do to engage your resident in conversation and really make it feel like you care about them. One thing you want to try to avoid with involving your resident in conversation, don't make it about you. Don't talk about your family excessively. You know, if they ask you about your family, you can tell them because the residents care about you too. Um, it's a two-way street with that. So if they ask you, you know, well, how are your, how's your family doing? How are your kids doing? You can tell them, but keep it limited. Try to involve the, involve the resident more in the conversation and get the conversation back to things that they want to talk about. Um, so you want to demonstrate acceptance with family involvement. Some families are very, very involved. Some families are not very involved. Some families you may only see, you know, once every six months. Some families you may see every day. So whatever that family member wants to do to stay involved in the care of the resident, within reason, we want to help them feel that they are helping. So if you have a family member that likes to come in and feed the resident, Absolutely. You know, as long as they're doing a safe job of it and they're not going to hurt the resident doing it, you know, of course, unintentionally. But if they are doing a good job of feeding the resident and they like to do that, absolutely encourage them to do that. Um, if you've got a resident that maybe can't get out of bed and the family likes to come in and give them a back rub, do lotion on their feet, whatever it is, absolutely encourage things like that. Um, you want to be careful, though, if a family member tries to maybe help a resident walk when the staff usually has to walk them if the resident's not quite steady. You may not know if that family member is okay to walk that person if maybe they haven't been trained properly like you have. So that may be something, you know, to offer to help walk the resident and the family can walk with them and talk with them rather than having to focus on, you know, doing the actual physical things or you might refer to the charge nurse with that. So you want to help the resident remain part of the church or community. Just because your residents might be in a long-term care facility or assisted living doesn't mean that they don't still have community involvement. A lot of people still like to go out to church. They still like to go out to community activities. You know, they like to go out with their family to different concerts and things like that really, really help encourage that. Help the resident, you know, look and feel their best when they're getting ready to go out in the community because a lot of people really take pride in their appearance and they don't want their hair looking like they just rolled out of bed and people, you know, may want their makeup done and they might want to make sure that all of their clothes are clean. And just remember, not only is that resident having their own pride in themselves with their appearance, but they are also a reflection of how people are being taken care of in the place that you work and what you're doing for them. So you also want to help the resident feel like 
the facility is their home. So some ways that you can do that is ask them the way that they like to do things. Uh, make sure that you're respectful whenever you enter their room or their apartment. Knock on the door. Knock on the door every single time that you go in. Announce yourself. Let them know that you're there. Ask them, you know, might call out their name and, you know, say, hey, Mrs. Smith, I'm here to help you this morning. Are you ready to get up? then you can do things like that and help them feel like it's their home. Um, be respectful of their things. A lot of people have very, very important precious possessions and they are not able to bring a whole lot into a nursing home setting. So whatever they can bring in is very, very important to them. You don't wanna break their favorite little china glass or whatever it is that they have. Some things that you can do to increase self-esteem and respect for the resident. You can show respect for the resident's age and genuine interest in their contribution within your facility. Call them by their preferred name. Don't call them honey or sweetie or darling or grandma or grandpa unless it is part of their plan of care. Um, Whenever you have people that come in to survey your facility to make sure that you're meeting the laws and the regulations called state surveyors, they will actually be looking for that to see if the residents are being called by their preferred name or if staff is using nicknames. Some of your residents may not want to be called honey or sweetie or grandma. They might want to be called by their preferred name. So find out what that is and make sure that you follow that. You want to absolutely respect privacy, including the privacy of their body during care. If you're giving somebody a bath, then you wanna keep things covered up unless it's necessary to uncover them. This will also help them feel secure and help them to not be cold, which is a big problem with the elderly sometimes. Um, you want to accept requests for care by a member of the same sex. A lot of people will not want someone of the opposite gender taking care of them and absolutely respect that. That can be kind of difficult sometimes if you have people that, you know, don't want somebody of an op the opposite sex taking care of them, but there's not very many staff members available that can do that. So you might have to think about trading assignments with somebody or working with your team members just to figure out what you can do to take care of that resident. Recognizing the resident's ability to hear staff during conversation, <laughs> just always, always, always have the mindset of the resident may be able to hear me. Don't talk about you know, other staff members in a bad way. Don't talk about other residents in a bad way. These are things that you shouldn't be doing anyway, but just always remember that the resident might be able to overhear what you're saying. So even if you're talking about um, things that are not bad, but they may be personal about other residents, you've got people that can always hear you. So ways to help with self-actualization with personal growth and development, Talk about the residents' awards and other accomplishments. Um, if they maybe were a tax accountant for 50 years and they got an award for that, ask them about it. Um, encourage them to visit about their past because a lot of the elderly that are in the nursing home, they have this feeling that they're not contributing anymore to society. Well, they may not be able to do the things that they used to, but they can still talk about the things that they were able to do at one time and have a lot of pride in that. So you can also allow the resident to verbalize negative things. If they have complaints um, or if they have issues that they're needing to talk about, let them talk about it. If you are not comfortable with some of the things that they need to talk about, um, then you can you know, ask them if, you can get somebody else to come in and talk about it. Just tell them that you're not quite comfortable. Um, but otherwise, let them vent. You may be the only person that's going to stop and listen to them. So let them talk about what they need to talk about. If they have complaints about their care or other issues like that, you need to take those complaints to the charge nurse and make sure that those are addressed. So you might help the resident participate in a meaningful activity say somebody used to be a homemaker they never had a job outside the home and they took care of their family and that's what they did so now they still love to bake but they're not able to so you might help the resident 
with some kind of activity um like if you're making cookies they can mix the cookie dough they can put together all the ingredients and you might help them you know put it in the oven and get it out but they can still do something else like that um, support residents' interests and ask them what they like to do. You don't have to be an activities person in order to support the residents' interests and to engage them. Um, identify what pleases them. So things like having um, a good view out the window. Ask them if they want to have the blinds open when it's really nice outside. If you have time, maybe see if they want to go outside for a walk. Things like that. Sometimes it's a simple thing that like to please people, and we want to find that out. So I want to take a moment just to kind of think about the different losses that people have whenever they have to go into a facility. Um, think about the fact that they are no longer able to work. So they may have really loved their job. They might have had a lot of satisfaction from work. They felt very useful. They felt like they were contributing to society. They may have had a lot of friends and you know people that they considered to be close when they worked. Um, also their income. They've had a loss of income from not working anymore and going into retirement status. So another thing that can happen with loss, um, think about your social relationships and companionships. A lot of people, especially that are elderly, will have a lot of death in their life. So they may have, you know, their spouse or their companion that has died. They have a lot of friends that have died. They have a lot of family that has died. They may be the last person alive out of their nine siblings. Um, they may be isolated due to limited mobility. They like to get out, you know, and see their friends and family that are still out in the community, but they can't because they're not able to do so. So people may not come visit them as much as they would like. Think about also the physical losses, home and property. Think about your house or your apartment, wherever you live. Um, how would you feel if you had to leave that behind? I know that would be a very, very distressing thing for a lot of us um, because even though, yes, they are possessions, we still have a lot of things in our homes that we have um, are, that are important to us. So that would be very, very difficult having to leave those behind and go to a totally new environment. Um, you're also going to have, you know, fi financial security loss with your home, um, safety, your health needs might require you from moving out of your home into a long term for care facility. So you're not only dealing with the loss of the home, you're also dealing with the loss of your health on top of that. As people get older, a lot of their senses will diminish. So they may have a diminished sense of smell, touch, vision, and hearing. This is going to put them at risk for a lot of safety issues, such as if they can't smell that their food has gone bad, if they can't feel that the water is scalding hot in the shower and they feel like it's not that hot, so they turn it up a little bit, um, if they can't see that there's a cord in the middle of the room and they trip over it, um, hearing, if they can't can't hear that another person is calling them, you know, warning them of some kind of danger. Um, there's also going to be some different changes in your physical appearance. Think about yourself, what you look like, and what you're going to look like in 30 or 40 years when you're elderly. It might be a little bit longer than that for some of us, but that's okay. Just think about the different physical changes that you go through as you get older. Um, you will have more wrinkles, your hair turns gray, it might fall out, you might get hair coming out in places that you didn't before, um, you might lose a lot of muscle, so your skin might be kind of hanging where it wasn't before. So we have a lot of different changes in physical appearances. Um, you'll have a lot of changes in physical ability, decreased balance, decrease mobility and decrease you know ability to get around decrease response time this one can kind of go along with the touch where say you're cooking and you get too close to the burner and you don't realize until it's too late that it's hot or elderly people that drive um, their vision may be decreased so they can't tell that that car in front of them is that close their depth perception might be off then it takes them longer to respond to hitting the brakes so that they don't hit that car in front of them. So that will carry over to different things in the nursing home as well. So they might feel like, you know, if they trip over the cord that they 
didn't see, then their response time to try to put their hands out to break the fall might be decreased. So they might land on their face on the floor rather than landing on their hands. So a lot of elderly people will have a little bit of memory changes and slow thinking. This is different than dementia because, you know, you can have forgetfulness and you can have some different memory issues, but dementia is a progressive loss of memory. And we will talk a lot about that one um, throughout the class. So you might also have a decreased ability to concentrate. Um, I know that that's true for a lot of us that are not elderly yet, but that's going to be more so as we get older. You might also have a generalized decline due to effects of chronic illnesses. So think about anybody you know that has a chronic illness, such as diabetes, such as heart failure, lung problems, liver disease, kidney disease. They're going to have a generalized decline just because of all those chronic illnesses. So what are some ways that we can take care of the residents in the face of these losses? Um, with privacy, you can absolutely maintain privacy by pulling the privacy curtain. If there's two people in a room, then you can pull the curtain between them so that they don't need to see what the other person is doing. Um, pull the window curtain or the blinds, absolutely do that because you never know, you know who's gonna be walking outside the window whenever you're providing care to that person and they don't need to see everything that's going on. Close the door whenever you're providing care. Don't allow staff in that are not involved in care unless it's an emergency. So if you are in taking care of the resident, giving them a bath, and one of your other staff members comes in, you really don't need their help, but they are just coming in to chat. That's not really cool. You need to have them excuse themselves or let them know, you know, I'll talk to you whenever I'm done with the resident's bath. I need to focus on this. Another thing that you can do for privacy um, is to knock on the door every time that you come into the room and announce yourself and ask if, ask if it's okay to come in. So some different things you can do for control over space and personal possessions. Encourage the resident to have choices. Um, whenever you're getting dressed in the morning, ask them what they want to wear. Even people with dementia can still tell you, you know, provide them with simple choices and say, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt? And they can usually tell you one or the other. Um, you can also request permissions to handle the resident's personal items. So say that you're bringing a lunch tray in and you need to put it on the bedside table and there's stuff all over the table. You need to ask the resident, may I move these things before I put this down? What would you like me to do with them? I think a lot of people wouldn't feel very comfortable and they'd be pretty mad if somebody just walked into their own home and started messing with all their stuff and putting it where they wanted to put it. Think about that. You're in the resident's home, so you want to be respectful of that. So some responsibility for home maintenance. Um, you can encourage participation in meal and snack preparation. If the resident is able to, you can provide, they can provide recipes for you and tell you whatever they want um, to eat if you want to do an activity. You can do some light room housekeeping or they can do that. You can have them help you make their bed. Some people really like to do that and that's going to help them feel useful. Um, personal laundry as a resident is able and the facility philosophy promotes. So say a resident really, really likes to do their own laundry and you're able to do that at your facility. Help them, see what you can do to help them and encourage that. So some social contact outside the facility. If the resident is involved in community activities, you want to absolutely encourage them to attend as they're able to. Identify some past community involvements and maybe attempt to bring them into the facility, such as a church group that, church group that they used to be involved with that they are not really heavily involved with now since they're in the facility. You might contact that church group and ask them, well, since this person's not out, able to come out to you, are you able to come in to them? If you're really not comfortable doing that kind of stuff, like contacting the different church groups, talk to your charge nurse, talk to the activities director, you know, talk to anybody else that's in your facility that might be able to help you out with that. If you have friends and family that come to visit, then provide space and time for that family and friends to visit. See if there's a special meeting room that they can go to. On page 159 of your CNA book, it talks about residents' rights. So the resident has a right to a dignified existence, self-determination, and communication with and access to persons and services inside and outside the facility. So according to Kansas Administrative Regulations and federal regulations, the home must protect and promote these rights. 
So those rights include the right to exercise their rights. So they have the right to, you know, promote those rights for themselves too. The right to be notified of their rights. So they have to know which rights that they have. The rights concerning finances and property. So the resident can manage their own financial affairs if they choose to do so. The right to the information about their care. So the resident has the right to be fully informed about care and treatment and any changes in that care or treatment that may affect their well-being. The right to make care decisions. So the resident is heavily involved in the plan of care and they also have the right to choose their physician, to refuse treatment, to refuse to participate in experimental research and so on and so forth. They also have the right to privacy, confidentiality, and dignity. So we will talk about those um, privacy and confidentiality as well. Um, coming up here in just a little bit. They have the right to address grievances. If they have a problem with the way their care is being given, they absolutely have the right to address that. Otherwise, if they don't tell us that they don't like the way we're doing things for them, how are we supposed to improve? So we want to make sure that the resident feels that they can address those grievances and without fear of retribution. So they shouldn't feel like if they complain about the care that they're receiving or have suggestions of ways that the care can be better, then we don't have the right to retaliate against them. So they have rights when transferred or discharged. They have the right to know um, that they're supposed to be transferred or discharged and receive advanced notice. So, and they also have the right to an appeal process. So your knowledge of residents' rights is mandatory and it must be demonstrated in resident care. So when we talk about those rights, we need to make sure that we uphold them. So some of the residents' rights are listed here in this slide, but I would like to take a minute and talk about the right to privacy and confidentiality. So there is a federal law that some of you have probably heard of called HIPAA, H I. PAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. The reason why this is important, and it's not for health insurance reasons for the stuff that we're talking about, the reason that HIPAA is important is because it covers laws of private and privacy and confidentiality. Now, privacy means that you get to keep your private information private to you. So you don't have to tell people all of your business. Now, confidentiality refers to other people can't tell your business. So we have the right, um, or residents have the right to privacy and confidentiality while they're living in an adult care home. So the way that we can protect that right is to make sure that we don't share any of what's called protected health information with other people. This is abbreviated as PHI. So if you ever see PHI, it means protected health information. And this is the stuff that we can't tell people um, and maintain that HIPAA law. So the protected health information can be all the identifying information about a resident, how people can tell where a resident lives and different things about them. So it can be their name, date of birth, social security number, who their doctor is, what their room number is, um, different things like that. What we want to do as caregivers is keep that information private and confidential. So I'll give you an example. If you're taking care of, you know, 10 residents at a facility and you have a report sheet and it has all of their name and room numbers on it and what you're supposed to do for them for the day. One way that you can maintain HIPAA privacy and confidentiality is taking that piece of paper to a shred box or shredding it at the end of your shift. Breaking HIPAA would mean you would take that piece of information out of the building and potentially have someone else see it. HIPAA laws are very, very strict and not only are prosecutors going after a facility if someone take, breaks HIPAA laws, but they're also going to go after you as being the person that broke that HIPAA law. So don't jeopardize your license by breaking HIPAA. You know, if you make a mistake and you accidentally take something out of the building, take it back and shred it as soon as you can. So one way that you can also protect people's privacy and confidentiality is when you get off shift and you go home and you talk to their, your family, you know, you might want to tell them about your day. 
do not use any kind of identifying information about your resident. So say you gave Mr. Jones a bath today and he was really funny and he told you all about his family and then he told you about his cancer that he has and he's really scared about it. When you go home, just don't talk about it. You can say things like, well, I have a resident that's going through a hard time right now. Leave it at that. Do not say, well, Mr. Jones is really having a hard time right now. He just found out he had cancer and we were talking about it when I gave him a bath today. That's not okay to talk about. If you have any questions regarding HIPAA, confidentiality, and privacy, please stop and ask your charge nurse. Whenever you do get hired onto a facility, you will go through HIPAA training no matter where you're at. So keep that in mind and keep in mind that it's very, very important to pay attention to the HIPAA laws. They're easy to break. So you've got to be on your A game, keeping those laws um, private and confidential. So we've talked a lot about um, what we expect to do when we care for the resident. However, we do need to talk a little bit about how we need to maintain ourselves and what the resident expects from us. So the resident and the family is going to expect you to look clean and neat, to be caring and communicate a positive attitude, to know the resident as a person, to listen to the resident or family request, respond promptly to a request, to report unresolved concerns or requests to a nurse, be competent, allow and encourage your resident to maintain independence as much as possible, and have integrity, which means being honest and dependable and acknowledging your mistakes. So looking clean and neat on the job goes far beyond having clean clothes. This means, you know, you don't have to have the nicest scrubs on, you don't have to have the newest shoes, that's okay. As long as you present yourself in a clean and neat manner, then you'll be fine. So this means coming to work with scrubs that are clean, don't have stains on them, they're not wrinkled, it doesn't look like you just rolled out of bed. You know, women or men that have longer hair, keep it off of your face so that the resident can see your face. Um, and keep your hair back so that if you lean over to give resident care that your hair is not in their face or falling onto them. Um, make sure that you smell good. Make sure that, you know, if you have issues with body odors that you address them. Make sure that your hands are clean. We will talk in this class a lot about hand washing, how to do it properly. However, when you come on shift, you still need to make sure that your hands are clean before you even come in the building. Look at your fingernails. See if there's dirt underneath your fingernails. How are your residents expected to know that you're going to take care of them and their needs if you can't take care of yourself? When you have shoes on, you want your shoes to be closed-toed, closed-heeled, non-skid soles. Usually tennis shoes, running shoes, anything like that will be acceptable. Don't wear Crocs or the shoes with the open holes in them in the top because you will get some sort of substance on them and regret that you did that. Um, also, you don't want to wear any kind of slippers or, you know, boots that are just not comfortable for you to wear because you're going to be on your feet all day. So you want to get a good pair of shoes. And again, it doesn't matter how much you spend, doesn't matter if they're the newest brand or, you know, the flashiest or whatever, as long as you're following your dress code of your um, employer and you have shoes that are clean and that aren't going to slip if you step on something or if you accidentally, you know, slide your foot on the floor, you're not going to slip and fall, then you should be fine. So you always want to be caring and communicate a positive attitude. We are all going to have bad days. We are all going to have days where we may not feel like getting out of bed and coming to work, but we do because we know we need to come take care of the residents. Don't let them see that. If you're not having the greatest of day, if you're having personal issues at home, leave it at the door. Your residents do not need to see that. That has no bearing on what you're doing for their care. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you're having some kind of issue where you're not able to take care of your residents that day and you're having a hard time, you know, focusing, 
talk to your charge nurse and see if there's any tips that they might be able to give you or see however they can adjust your work assignment. So know your resident as a person. Take a personal investment in them. You may not need to know, you know, everything about them, like where they grew up and who their high school principal was and, you know, all that good stuff, but you do need to know what your resident likes and what your resident doesn't so that they can feel like you really care about them. If you have a request from a resident or family, you need to listen to it and respond promptly. If you're not able to resolve concerns or meet that request, let the charge nurse know. You also want to be competent. This means that they feel like you know what you're doing. Along with that can go confidence. You act like you know what you're doing. If you walk into a room to get a resident out of bed and you're not quite sure what you're doing, you know what you're doing, but you're kind of nervous and you know, you go up and tell the resident, well, I'm just not sure how I'm going to be able to get you out of bed. I'm, I'm really kind of nervous about this and you know, just kind of, kind of be nice to me because I'm really not sure what I'm doing that's not going to instill confidence in you by your resident. So you want to be able to make sure you're competent and confident. So you also want to allow and encourage the resident to maintain independence as much as possible. I know we've already hit this subject before, but it's very, very important. If your resident can still get themselves dressed, allow them to get themselves dressed no matter how slow they are. If they are still able to feed themselves, let them feed themselves. Encourage them. Make sure that they can do everything as much as they can because if you don't use it, you lose it. And eventually, if you're doing everything for your resident, there's going to come a point where they're not able to do it for themselves. When if you had maintained their independence and encouraged it, they can keep doing things for themselves a lot longer. So have integrity. Be honest and own up to your mistakes. So if you make a mistake, own it. Don't try to sweep it under the rug. Don't try to blame it on somebody else. You need to recognize what your mistake is and learn from it so that you don't make that mistake again. So as we learned in unit one, OPA requirements help us maintain and improve quality of life and quality of care for your residents. Part of this is to provide services and activities for each resident to maintain the highest level of well-being for them, whether it's mental, physical, psychosocial, emotional, anything like that. We also want to provide a safe and home-like environment. So you don't want to feel like you're going into an institution if you're that resident. We try to avoid that as much as possible by, you know, allowing them to bring in their own things, allowing them to tell us what kind of schedule they like to have, allowing them to make choices as much as possible. So some different types of facilities in Kansas. There are nursing facilities, also called long-term care, nursing homes, nursing centers. These kinds of facilities will provide 24 hour a day, seven day a week nursing care. So they are always gonna have staff on hand to help um, provide for every kind of need that, that person might have. So these residents have functional impairments requiring skilled nursing care for activities of daily living limitation. So maybe they can't get out of bed and go to the bathroom by themselves. So they can't feed themselves. They can't um, dress themselves. Those kind of things are the things that would be addressed in a nursing facility. Assisted living and residential health care facilities, these are a little bit different um, because they are individual apartments or living units and they provide a little bit less care for that person. So these might be people that can get up and get around on their own, but they might need a little bit of help getting dressed. They really shouldn't cook anymore, so they have the meals provided for them, but they can feed themselves. So they can have that skilled services that are provided on an intermittent or a limited term basis. So they're not gonna be needing a lot of help all the time. The difference between these is with staffing, in a nursing facility, you're going to have a lot more staffing. You're going to have a nurse on hand 24 hours a day, a licensed nurse in addition to the CNAs. In an assisted living in a residential healthcare facility, people don't need a nurse on 24 hours a day. So they may have a nurse on 24 hours a day or they may not. 
depends on the facility that you go to. They are also going to have a lot less staff that are working there, a lot less nurse aides, and a lot less medication aides because the residents don't need quite as much help. If they get to the point where they need 24-hour care on an ongoing basis, then it would be time to have them go to a nursing facility. Another type of facility in Kansas is called a Home Plus. This is an adult care home that has more than five and less than 12 residents residing in it, and it is in an actual home setting. So you can take a regular house, and if it meets the requirements set forth by the regulations, then you can have people come into that house and be residents there. There's a lot more to it, but that's just kind of the basics of it. So the level of care is going to be determined by the preparation of staff and the rules and regulations set forth by KDADS. What this means is Home Plus, they can take anybody from somebody needing just a little bit of help so maybe they can do everything for themselves but they're not safe to do their own medications they can go into a home plus all the way to somebody that's maybe end of life that needs absolutely everything done for them they need to be turned they need to be changed they need to be fed they need to be bathed everything so home pluses can take that depending on how much and how well prepared their staff are so it's individual up to those home pluses who they are able to take so a boarding care home is a little bit different it also operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not more than 10 individuals. And these people might be there due to a little bit of functional impairment and might need supervision of their activities of daily living, but essentially remain ambulatory. They can get up and walk and can manage their own affairs. So this might be somebody, again, similar to the very, um, you know, high functioning person that might go into a home plus, they might just need their stuff supervised. So maybe their medications just need to be set up, but they can still take them on their own. Or they might need somebody there just to kind of watch them get dressed, but they can do everything pretty much on their own. So the last type is an adult daycare. This operates less than 24 hours a day. Um, this assists individuals with different impairments that might need supervision or assistance with ADLs. So this is somebody that normally can live in their own home outside of a facility, but say they live with their daughter, but their daughter has to work during the day and the daughter has to help them with everything at night, you know, help them maybe get up to the bathroom, cook for them, clean for them, all this stuff. So they might come to an adult daycare during the day to have that supervision and to have that social interaction and get them out of the house. One type of place um, that is kind of a blend of different facilities is called a continuing care retirement community. So this can include independent living, which is not licensed, can include assisted living or residential health care, and can include a nursing home unit. So the advantage to these is somebody can come in for independent living, live on campus, do their own thing, maybe then they start needing a little bit of help. They're going to be the first people to be able to move into that assisted living and get priority for that. So then they live in assisted living for a while, then they start declining a little bit more and they need more help. So then they're able to move into that nursing home setting. So that's really the advantage of those continuing care retirement communities. They can live on the same campus and they can live in the same area and deal with the same staff and not have to move um, you know, to a totally different place. They just move to a different area. You can also have um, long-term care units in hospitals. So this is another place that you can look at for employment. Um, some of your smaller hospitals will have these long-term care units and not a lot of the bigger ones will because there's so many long-term care facilities available. So these, even though they are in a hospital, they are still regulated by KDADS. This concludes our Chapter 2 PowerPoint. Um, please, again, if you have any questions of your instructors, let us know. Um, we're happy to help you and we're here to help you succeed. We will have some additional worksheets or a quiz at the conclusion of this PowerPoint and a video. Thank you.